come and uh, he's going to give us part two of what he covered last week. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And happy new year. I'm going to pick up where we left off. Um, after a short review, I want to remind you, we talked about Daniel 70 weeks and um, we pointed out that there's a, a potential uh, void between the 69th and 70th week. Uh, and I showed you um, how we come to that you know, conclusion by asking the question, is uh, Israel as a nation, are they righteous now in God's eyes and free from sin? And that's what the beginning of the 70 week prophecy, verse 24, 924, says that, um, that that will be the outcome of the 70 weeks prophecy. So that has not been fulfilled yet is the point. And, uh, and then I wanted to show, and I think I did show last week that uh, this prophecy is for Daniel's people and Daniel's city, as it says, which would be the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem in particular. And we have a part in this in an odd way in that it's the church, the body of Christ, that stops that void, that gap. Uh, it, the 70th week resumes after the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. So we talked about those things last week. And uh, so I want to uh, go through a little bit of what we talked about before. Um, and I was explaining the 70 weeks are uh, 70 weeks of years. And uh, I had mentioned that scholars agree uh, that study this, that, that that's the case. Um, my friend, uh, Brother Craig Nelson, uh, called me at work and he had noted that comment. And he said, uh, there's a place in scripture that will also prove that the weeks are years. And so uh, we can look at that and thank you, Craig, for that. Um, let's look at Genesis 29 verses 18 through 28. And uh, you'll see here the use of the word week uh, referring to years, uh, seven years. Uh, verse 18, and Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel thy younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. And Jacob said unto Laban, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him. And he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah, his maid, for a handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did I not serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, it must not be done, it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him to Rachel his daughter to wife also. So um, in verse 27, thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years, shows that the term week used 
in the beginning of that verse, fulfill her week, um, is indeed uh, to be interpreted years. So uh, thanks, Craig, for that. And uh, so uh, our 70 weeks of years would add up to 490 years, uh, the full 70 weeks. And uh, 69 weeks, we talked about that, have been fulfilled already. Um, uh, the first seven weeks was the rebuilding of the wall and the street, which we talked about that was one and the same, the wall and the street surround the city of Jerusalem. After the Babylonian captivity, they went back and rebuilt that and the city. Um, uh, that was Nehemiah's desire. And then um, that was the first seven weeks. And then 62 weeks um, added to the seven, uh, making 69. Uh, the 62 weeks uh, uh, with the seven lead up unto Messiah the Prince. Uh, we read in Daniel, and that's a reference we learned last week to when Christ rode into Jerusalem uh, on the colt, uh, the foal of an ass, as their prince, as their king, and uh, fulfilled that part of the prophecy. That was about 32 AD, and after 32 AD, um, you would expect that final one week or seven year period, um, which would have ended around 39 AD, and then Israel would have been righteous in God's eyes uh, and free from sin. And we realize that today that's not the case, even now, 2,000 years later. So uh, <clears throat> um, I think that's pretty good review. And so I want to pick up, uh, why don't we go to, uh, back to Daniel 9.26 a minute, and uh, I want to get more detail on that. <clears throat> Daniel 9.26. <clears throat> And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That's a reference to the crucifixion, uh, cut off from the living, as it says in Isaiah. Um, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. There's a reference to um, the um, destruction of of the temple and um, the city. Um, the people of the prince that shall come there uh, are the ones that destroy the temple. We know that in 70 AD, Titus came with his soldiers and destroyed the city. So uh, commentators, uh, uh, many of them will say, well, the people of the prince that shall come, that's the Roman soldiers. And, and uh, so when they think of a future, uh, the people of the prince, um, and, and they think of um, Daniel 9, 27, um, the he that confirms the covenant, they associate that with the prince that shall come, and so they associate that with Rome. Uh, Titus was a Roman leader, and so in the end times it must be a Roman leader or somehow connected. And uh, But I'm going to show here that the people of the prince that shall come were not necessarily Titus's soldiers. They were just people that did not follow God. They were uh, um, children of Cain, you could say. Um, I'm going to read a quote here. Um, oh, um, 
I'm just quoting, the people of the prince that shall come in verse 26 is not necessarily a specific reference to the people of the Roman ruler Titus, but to anyone who walks according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the children of disobedience, those who are by nature the children of wrath. That's who destroyed the temple. Ephesians 2, 2 and 3 says, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were among those uh, people of the prince uh, that shall come. Uh, we were part of that before we made our decision to follow Christ. And so uh, thank God we're free from that. Um, in Matthew, Jesus Christ identifies Cain as a Pharisee. Uh, I want you to look at Matthew 23. Please turn there. And it doesn't just come out and say Cain was a Pharisee, but I think we can look at a number of verses and then uh, come to that conclusion. Matthew 23, look at verse starting here, 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. I'm going to stop right there and go to verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 26, thou blind Pharisee. Verse 27, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, verse 31, wherefore be ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Verse 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify. He's speaking to the Pharisees. And some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. So they mentioned Abel, the righteous Abel, the blood of Abel. Who killed Abel but Cain? So Cain is described here as a Pharisee, I believe. And also, um, he identifies Abel as a prophet. Um, look at verse Matthew uh, chapter 11, verse 50. <clears throat> uh, let's see, did I get that right? Something wrong here. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I got, uh, it would be Luke. Yeah, Luke 11, my bad. Luke 11, 50. This is uh, where he describes Abel as a prophet. That the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation, verse 51, 
from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. So verse 50, the blood of all the prophets. And then 51, from the blood of Abel. So he's including him among prophets. So uh, I taught a long time ago uh, uh, when we talked about Cain and Abel uh, that some people feel sorry for Cain, that, that he wanted to please the Lord and he brought a, a nice sacrifice to the Lord. Um, but it was a sacrifice you know, of him and not what the Lord required or wanted. And I believe that Abel being the prophet was aware of what God demanded for the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice. And so don't feel sorry for Cain. He disobeyed uh, what the prophet had told him. I believe that's the case. We don't find detail of that in scripture. Um, both Cain and Abel wanted to please God. But Cain stood in his own righteousness and Abel in that of the Lord's. All of mankind is represented by one of these two brothers. We are either attempting to please God with our own works as Cain did, or we by faith trust in the word of God and receive God's righteousness. There are no other choices for us. We are either of Cain, uh, people of the prince that shall come, or of Abel people of Messiah, the Prince. Um, many of us in this room and, and watching today, I believe, are of Messiah, the Prince. Let's look uh, at Romans 128. <clears throat> uh, 128 through 32, I'm going to read. Let's see. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, covetousness maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, inflexible, um, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Um, people of the prince that shall come. Uh, also, let's look at Ephesians 2 and verses 1 through 7. And uh, I think we're going to read more about people of the prince that shall come. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation uh, or lifestyle uh, in life uh, in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us, toward us through Christ Jesus. Um, so uh, his great mercy um, 
this is an example of where we've been and and where we where we end up as members of the church, the body of Christ. Uh, so, um, a little bit more review. Um, I had mentioned the four things that happen in the uh, void between 69th and 70 weeks. Uh, and I guess uh, I'll just read uh, point one was the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was in 32 AD. Um, and then the revelation of the mystery and the birth of the church, the body of Christ, happened um, uh, at, during Paul's day in the 60s uh, AD. And then... Um, 70 AD, the destruction of the temple uh, is in there, and then uh, yet to happen is the rapture is going to happen before the 70th week. So we're looking forward to that, I believe, at any moment. Uh, and then we uh, got to the last, uh, Daniel 9.27, the final week. Uh, Daniel 9.27, he shall confirm the covenant with many. We decided that was Israel um, for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. The midst of the week would be half of seven, uh, three and a half years. So once that final seven year period kicks in, uh, it's going to be... Um, in two parts, and uh, so I'm trying to get to part two here, <laughs> uh, a lot of review, um, yeah, and then we looked at other references to the future seven year period, um, there's so many, I'll just pick one here, um, Luke 21, 22, for these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Uh, uh, Matthew 24, 21, for then shall be great tribulation, as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Um, so uh, then we ended last week with 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Okay, part two. What shall be the end of these things? That title I get from Daniel 12, um, verses 7 and 8, where, um, well, why don't we turn there real quick to, to see this. Daniel 12. And verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Um, the word scatter there can also be interpreted as shatter. Um, uh, some of the Jewish Bibles say shatter for that word. So it would read, and when he shall have accomplished to shatter the power of the holy people, all of these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So when, uh, here uh, it, there's this mention of a time, times and a half, that's three and a half years. Um, and things are getting pretty bad. And, and so there's the question, when is this seven year time gonna end? Um, 
And so that's the title of part two, um, where that came from. So let's take a look at this period. Um, I think it's best described in Second Thessalonians um, chapter two. Let's look at verses one through eight in Second Thessalonians. <clears throat> Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him what uh, what do you think that's a reference to right there does anyone have a guess um, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. It's got to be the rapture of chapter 4, verse, or 1 Thessalonians 4. Yeah, the rapture, a reference to the rapture, indeed. Uh, verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Well, what have we learned about the man of sin being revealed? Is that not Daniel's 70th week? Um, and he makes the covenant, uh, the peace treaty, uh, with many uh, that's the he makes the treaty and so now we go from the rapture mentioned in verse 1 and now we're talking about something else uh, we're talking about the seven year period uh, I believe uh, and I'm open for discussion here as I go. Uh, I'll read on. Um, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So at the end of this period, um, the wicked is destroyed with the brightness of his coming. So that will be the end of that, that seven year period. Uh, some believers wondered whether they had missed the rapture and were experiencing Daniel's 70th week. Paul informed them that they could not be in that 70th week because two major events had not yet occurred. One of them is the revelation of the man of sin had not been revealed yet in Paul's time. So there's one other thing that has to happen. The man of sin has to be revealed. Well, what would follow the man of sin but lies? and deceit and people are going to go for it and the other thing then that happens during that time is doctrinal apostasy second thessalonians 9 uh, i'm sorry let's turn to second thessalonians 2 um, we're there now verse 9 
through 12. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceitful, uh, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God shall send them strong delusion. The people who follow self-righteousness, the way of Cain, are described here. And those of us who follow the way of Abel um, are caught up in the rapture. Those who remain, God gives them strong delusion that they'll believe that lie, and everyone's going to go for it. The Antichrist is the Messiah. They think that, and they are going. God's going to allow that. It, it's almost like um, when God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, you know, again, you want to feel sorry for Pharaoh. God hardened his heart. Well. Pharaoh made it clear where he was headed and and his heart was already that way and so in this case too people who follow Cain's way uh, will also be given strong delusion and believe the lie um, the day of Christ mentioned here uh, this term generally refers to the time of the catching away uh, and are gathering together unto him. Um, the day of Christ, the day of Jesus Christ, that's when he comes in the clouds and, and we meet him in the air. But Paul speaks here of that day as being the time of the revelation of the man of sin. Uh, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. <clears throat> 1552 says <clears throat> I'll read 51 first behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Um, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be taken out of the way. Uh, Paul may be referring to a moment in time where the rapture of the church and the revelation of the man of sin occur simultaneously. The church, the, the restrainer, uh, the Holy Spirit in the church, the body of Christ is is restraining the man of sin. He can't reveal himself until we're gone. Um, so I think Paul used that term, day of Christ, there uh, because it's pivotal. It, it's the moment the church leaves in the twinkling of an eye, and then the man of sin uh, is there to deceive the nations. Um, I want to look at a, to define uh, another term, the day of the Lord. Um, here we're talking about day of Christ. Um, look at Amos. Uh, we'll get into the prophets here. Amos 5.16. <clears throat> this would be a first mention of uh, the day of the Lord. And often the first mention is uh, the clearest meaning of it. Amos. Oh, here he is. Uh, 5.16. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, Wailing uh, shall be in all streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas, and they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and such as are skillful lamentation, to wailing 
and in all vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Verse 18, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not of light. And if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Does that describe the moment, the twinkling of an eye, uh, the coming of the Lord for the church? Uh, no, this describes the Lord's coming, uh, the vengeance and the wrath. And so I just wanted to make that distinction, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. Um, let's see. Now I want to talk about that word, uh, uh, the apostasy. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's turn to Acts 21. verse 17 through 21. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, this is James and the twelve, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. So James here is pointing out that that's fine, we rejoice that you're leading Gentiles and, and, and people to the, to the truth, um, but he's not been teaching the law. Paul had a different revelation uh, from the Lord directly. Um, so here, uh, James is saying, see all of us here who believe, um, but we're all zealous of the law. Uh, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses or to forsake the law, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Um, the word forsake there, um, thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. That's the first use, use of the word in fact, the only other uh, of the word apostasy, the Greek word. And so um, Paul's use of the term, uh, uh, first I want to turn back to 2 Thessalonians uh, 2. Um, and, and, and Paul talked about the falling away. Uh, the man of sin must be revealed and there must be a falling away or that word is translated apostasy. So here we have that apostasy again. And is it from Moses, uh, you know, uh, going away from Moses? In this case, it's going away from the new, what replaced the law, the teachings of Paul. This is the apostasy mentioned here in 2 Thessalonians. Um, let's see, uh, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed. So it's the falling away, the apostasy, 
it says uh, there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. It's easy to interpret that as the apostasy comes first, the falling away. And uh, the church, you know, is all liberal and, and goes away from sound teaching. And then that man of sin is revealed. And I'm going to suggest it's just the opposite. Um, the thing, it says a, a falling away first, it, it means it has to happen before that day comes. Not before the man of sin comes. But it's talking about that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. Those two things should be put together. The man of sin revealed and the falling away or apostasy. So the apostasy referred to here occurs during the seven year tribulation period. And as is often taught, uh, it, it's they're teaching us the apostasy now that, that, that the, the liberal church and the, the falling away from sound teaching that we see today, they're uh, mistakenly uh, applying this to that. And, and I, I think I've just clarified what this is talking about. Um, Paul's use of the term refers to the great number of people who will forsake Paul's teachings while believing Satan's lies during the tribulation period after the rapture when Jew and Gentile believers also known as the church body of Christ are no longer on the scene. When does the fulfillment of this prophecy resume? Um, 2 Thessalonians 2, we're there now, uh, verses 6 and 8. Uh, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity both uh, uh, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Um, the word letteth uh, is um, Old English for hinder or prevent. So he who now prevents... Uh, will prevent until he be taken out of the way. And that's again um, the uh, restrainer. Uh, the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence holds back or restrains the power of lawlessness and of Antichrist revealing. At a future time when God's people are removed at the rapture, the unique role of the Holy Spirit, uh, that the Holy Spirit... Of, of the church age, the restrainer will be removed, allowing the appearance of the Antichrist and increased lawlessness in the world. Um, now, uh, um, and then I've got a couple references here then to the rapture. And so, um, in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, um, we'll be raised incorruptible. Um, now, uh, I'm running low on time, so I want to skip to a uh, touchy, uh, a difficult uh, study, and that's the book of Revelation. Um, but we have a unique opportunity here with the study we've just made in Daniel. Uh, I think it's a, a it gives us an opportunity to understand some of Revelation chapter 12 in particular. Uh, so let's take advantage of this. Uh, and as time's running out here, let's see if we can understand something in Revelation uh, chapter 12. Uh, verses 6 through 14. And as we read, just imagine what we've just studied and remember what we've studied and see if it, um, you know, uh, reverberates here. Uh, verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, the woman being Israel, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. That's three and a half years. 
And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast down unto earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. The woman is Israel, the man-child is the Lord Jesus Christ. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So in the midst of the seven year period, the woman's gonna be given wings of a great eagle uh, and go to the wilderness and Satan's looking to kill and, and destroy her and she's being protected and, um, and uh, she's actually nourished um, during that time. It says in verse 14, where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time. Um, uh, let's look at uh, Daniel 12, 6 and 7. I'm uh, skipping some things here as I'm running low on time. Uh, Daniel 12, 6 and 7, relative to what we just read. And uh, we read this earlier. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when, the, uh, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Um, and then uh, Jeremiah 37 uh, says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Um, and then Daniel 9, 24, uh, remember, was a summary of the 70 weeks prophecy. And, um, and uh, that's at this time um, when the Lord appears. Um, that's when that righteousness and uh, they recognize the Lord when he appears and uh, they are righteous in God's eyes at that time. Um, I got just enough time to squeeze in um, another mysterious pause. <laughs> and, and so we've talked about the gap between the 69th and 70th week. Um, well, there's another gap I can show you, and um, Brian, you'll be familiar with this one. Uh, turn to Luke 14, 16 through 22. <clears throat> Luke 14, or I'm sorry, Luke 4, 
16 through 22. <clears throat> okay, Luke 4. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet, prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them which uh, that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. So the last thing he says there, verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He's reading Isaiah here, and he closed the book after that, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Um, if we go to... Um, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. This is what Jesus was reading. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God's upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to pro proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. Now this is where the Lord stopped reading, but Isaiah keeps going. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Um, a comparison with the passage quoted in Isaiah 61, one and two affords an instance of the awesome accuracy of scripture. Jesus stopped at the acceptable year of the Lord, which is connected with the first advent. The day of vengeance of our God belongs to the second advent. So far, 2,000 years separate the first advent from the second advent. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we uh, are running low on time, um, within the gap of fulfillment between Daniel's 69th and 70th week, resides the church, the body of Christ. We're in that, that, that mysterious gap, um, the chronological gap. Uh, uh, see, the gap in Daniel is a gap of fulfillment of prophecy. This gap we're reading now is a gap in time. Uh, the chronological gap between the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God is also home to the church, the body of Christ, uh, currently. And uh, I think with that, I should uh, wrap it up. Um, I, I will add one great irony that, that I observed. Uh, Ezekiel 28.3, um, um, talking to Satan here. Behold, thou art, wi art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. Uh, he's telling Satan, you're wiser than Daniel. Um, number one, I wonder why he doesn't say Solomon. You know, he's the wisest. Uh, but anyway, uh, he says, behold, thou art wiser, art wiser than Daniel. Uh, the irony here is God's biggest secret of all was tucked away right there in Daniel's writings between his 69th and 70th weeks. And I'll end with Ephesians 8, uh, Ephesians 3, 8 through 10. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And I'll end with that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, bud. Appreciate you. Uh,
stepping up the last two weeks to uh, teach class. Next Sunday, we will resume uh, the normal class. We're going to continue with the class on the uh, King James Bible. We'll resume that next Sunday and then uh, go for as long as makes sense to go with that uh, in the first half of 2022. So with all that being said, uh, we're going to close the live stream. Thanks for joining us. Those of you that were live, check, come back in a day or so and look for the notes. You can send me your notes again, right? Yes. And we'll, uh, we'll get those up there on the website and then look for us again next 